Hier geht es jetzt um die Welt in 25 Minuten. Die wirtschaftliche Planbarkeit ist ja so schwierig wie kaum zuvor in der Geschichte. Und wir wollen uns jetzt anschauen, wie es mit der Konjunktur weitergeht und wie die einzelnen Risiken in Branchen und Regionen genau aussehen werden, sofern man das überhaupt äh, seriös prognostizieren kann. Das ist sicher kein leichter Job, aber wenn ihn wer kann, dann können das unsere beiden Ökonomen, Christiane von Berg, Regional Economist, Kofas Northern Europe und Belgium und Szegor Szielewicz, Head of Economic Research, Kofas Central and Eastern Europe. Sie werden uns jetzt ein Risk Assessment geben und ich darf Sie beide auf die Bühne bitten. Grüß Gott, willkommen, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here again as last year and again. I'm supported with a great economist uh, from neighboring region, Christiane von Berg. So together we will try to capture what's going on uh, in the global economy, in the Austrian economy. Uh, we'll try to do it in 25 minutes. That's, I think, a big challenge for us. It is. It is. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, but we will do our best. Um, so, uh, well, Starting, I think we will start directly what's uh, happening right now. And I think the reason what we have, at least at COFAS, is that we had lots of downgrades. Exactly. Um, so just that you are prepared. Last year, I spoke German. I still can't speak German, but that would be then otherwise a very, it would be more a monologue than a dialogue. <laughs> so this is why I uh, excuse myself here and speak English. And indeed, we are talking about country risks. This is our current country risk map at COFAS. That's it. Uh, well, what we did last time, uh, we did, I think you won't be surprised, we did lots of downgrades uh, recently. Uh, actually, we downgraded 19 countries. We have assessments for more than 160 countries. But that, that what we did uh, is, as I said, downgrades of 19 countries, and that mostly countries coming from Europe. Uh, as a reminder, uh, perhaps some of you do not know this tool that we use uh, here. Uh, it is uh, the assessment, the risk assessment, that is focused on the corporate risk. So somehow we are similar to rating agencies that oh, come do. On. Come on. Okay. That, that just they are, initial yeah. comparison. Oh, come on, they are me, only give focusing me to, on to sovereign. say the second sentence. No, they are only focusing on sovereign risk. Exactly. That is on sovereign risk. We add to that. Of course, we use uh, similar factors, like, for example, economic, financial, political indicators uh, for particular countries. But environmental risk. Environmental risk. Yes, exactly. I think about the drought outside. <laughs> That's it. But what we add here, we add to that uh, also uh, what comes from our internal database, from that what our underwriters do. Uh, so that's what we can expect in particular sectors, in pa particular countries, plus business climate assessment. All in all, we have uh, eight grade uh, scale, as you can see, starting from A1, low risk level. Right now, not so many, as far as I remember, only four countries, right? Yep, At A exactly. A1 level. Uh, going to E, extreme uh, risk level. Uh, Austria was recently downgraded among those 16 countries in Europe I mentioned. We had also downgrade for Germany. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> negative message for you, Christiane, but also for people here because Austria exports so uh, huge volumes to, to Germany. Yeah, but actually what, what is striking me, so um, you remember maybe last year when we talked about exactly this map and it was that Austria was still in A2 then when Germany was down in A3. And I don't know how it is from your perspective, but we Germans think always we are, oh, we are so great. And uh, why is Austria better than Germany? Come on. I mean, okay, if France is better than Germany, then we have a problem. But still, when Austria is better than Germany, we are still thinking, what's going on? So this time, you downgraded Austria with us. With yes, the yes, but, but previously I had a really good schnitzel here, so there was no reason for downgrade, so... 
you know. Uh, well, that was ages ago. That, that, uh, that, yeah, that, ages that was that. <laughs> two and a half years ago, uh, we had the beginning of the pandemic. But actually, we noticed that Austria indeed um, managed quite well uh, the pandemic. We fastly introduced measures, also lockdown measures, but that were quite harmful for businesses, but also support measures that were introduced fast. The traffic light system for, for the regions, once there, are be there was a better situation, then lockdowns were eased. Uh, so at that time, uh, indeed, we are not so negative, but we are unfortunately negative right now. We see, as I said, for a bulk of European countries, uh, we uh, had downgrades, and that concerns mostly Europe. Uh, but by the way, we had two upgrades exactly. uh, also we had recently. We had two upgrades. We had one in Angola and one in Brazil. And what do they have in common? They are strong in commodities, so of course, if you are right now a commodity exporter and living from it, like oil, and you are not in a certain of these blocks, you know, I have the feeling that now we are slowly going back into this block system that we had during the Cold War, right. and, and now we have Angola and Brazil, and they are not particularly in one, in one of these parties, so they are right now in favor of this uh, strong increase of, of commodity prices. So at least two are winning from that situation. Yes, exactly. For them, commodities, as you said, for the whole economy, for yeah. the business sector, it's important. We could find in other countries like the US, Canada, in the Middle East, some countries, but nevertheless, it does not affect so strongly the whole exactly. economy. We will move to sector risk assessments uh, afterwards. Um, so then, uh, perhaps let's move to more details of, of economies to the recent data. Uh, Jarek just told you uh, that uh, there was a release of data indeed for Austria. Uh, it was an upward revision that was done quite recently because at first even data were, uh, I think, on a positive side. We can say that not only in case of Austria but in case of a number of European countries when we expected that uh, after the second quarter of this year, so the full period uh, since the Russian-Ukraine uh, war started, uh, since all this impact of commodities prices increases, lots of those challenges uh, were here, uh, we expected that uh, it, it will be downturn. Exactly. Ex I mean, think about it. I, I don't know how it is for you, but we will come to that later on. Inflation was strong, so we thought, okay, people will save. People will think, okay, uh, let's prepare for the worst. But look at these numbers. These are GDP numbers. Uh, where we have taken um, the pre-pandemic level at 100, so in this time Q4 2019, and then we wanted to see where we are right now in this, in this development. And you see, for example, China emerging quite fast out of this recession, although right now it went down by 2.6% quarter over quarter. And the reason is, of course, the big um, lockdown in Shanghai and other provinces. E even right now, uh, I think one week ago, they shut down a, a city with more than 18 million people. So more people living in this city than in the whole Netherlands. Think about that. And they just shut it down from one day to another. So, of course, this will be a development that we will see further on in the next quarters. But what is really striking is that we have Exactly. We have countries in Europe that are surprisingly strong. Yeah. And I mean, there were upgrades even. Ooh, Germany. Germany was at zero, and then we were upward revised to 0 0.1. And Germany was at, yeah, growth. Yeah, and then we so saw what you, in Austria. You, the Austrian <laughs> economy is revised from 0 0.5 to 1.5. You, you have yeah. really strong reasons to be happy. Uh, just, uh, Christiane, one uh, word or one sentence more on, on China. As you said, minus 2.6 uh, quarter over quarter terms, plus 0 0.4 year over year terms in the second quarter for China. China, that the economy that, as you know, used to grow by 10% or more 10%. Yeah. 0 0.4% in annual terms. It's like recession yeah, there. Yeah. And here we have to remember about their zero COVID policy, that it will again affect supply chains. We are not finished uh, with that issue. Uh, as Christiane said, there were some lockdown measures again implemented, but again closer to autumn, or we are quite close to autumn, but closer to winter, we could expect that again this zero COVID policy uh, will shape also the Chinese economy, which is struggling. The U.S. economy is also struggling. That one that we previously mentioned that, okay, it's 
faster with acceleration with the recovery process yeah. uh, than Europe. But right now we see that with increase of interest rates, uh, with savings already used by households, and this is the consumption-driven economy, of course, even if they export uh, various uh, products, various commodities, but it's a consumption-driven economy. Uh, for, for them, for the, this global picture, uh, it's uh, quite bad, but as we said, in Europe, at least in Q2, data were positive. Uh, well, can we expect that it will remain? Depends. Exactly. I mean, it depends how long the summer is, how long the temperatures will be warm. And I think that's the time to move from economic forecasts to the weather forecasts. <laughs> <right? laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, it uh, comes with those gas storage levels that, exactly. that we have uh, in Europe, uh, which I believe, uh, what data we put here, the latest one. Uh, the latest so one the from yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the average is like above 80% in kinds of the European Union average. Uh, well, it's not bad because 80% uh, was supposed to be reached by the end of October? As no, 1st of October. 1st of October. First of, in, in, so we are thinking that from 1st of October the heating season begins, but mm -hmm. of course um, global warming is in our favor. I do not expect that I have to use my heating system anywhere before mid-November maybe. Mm. So I don't know how it is here in Vienna. I don't know how it is with you. So, But if you are living in, in the near to Frankfurt where it's really warm, then uh, we, we almost never get snow. So. So yes, but in case of the European Union comparison, uh, or not only European Union because we have UK and Ukraine here, yeah, I thought you, that you can see that uh, those storage levels look not bad. It look a little bit worse for Austria, for Hungary, for Latvia, Latvia and of course Ukraine. Uh, in case of Austria and um, uh, also Hungary, this dependence on Russian gas remains uh, very big. It's important. Uh, issue and, and also in terms of gas storage levels, uh, it's, it's not brilliant. Well, but I think it's the issue that we could survive, especially if we um, somehow reduce consuming gas over next months. We could come uh, to, uh, we could survive this winter till March. Yeah, next this year. winter, yes. Yeah, but the question is about next winter. Exactly. And even before those two winters, remember that all various industries use natural gas for, for its production and so on. I think there was an estimate uh, coming, coming from one think tank that uh, they estimated if we have complete cut of Russian gas, uh, what's actually looking at Nord Stream 1 right now uh, it is. Is, is happening, and we have a harsh winter, then it, we would be uh, at 9% of storage level at average in the European Union uh, in March 2023. Okay. And then, we need, even if we at our homes do need uh, gas for, for heating, various industri industries need it. And then we will have another uh, winter. Uh, infrastructure to be redirected from Russian flows to other ones, even if other countries exporting LNG are open to that, it's not so easy and it's not um, to be done so fast. Yeah, especially when it comes to LNG. So in Germany, we are working right now on two LNG terminals, but I mean, Austria has a problem, no sea, at least no sea access. Yeah. So uh, this is, all, of course, something that we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about it. And, and of course, this has an impact on the energy prices. We are showing them to you here on the right-hand side. And uh, it, is, it is something that we see, well, everything is okay. And then there is one news coming from Nord Stream 1. There's a turbine that has, needs uh, maintenance Okay, so we're down to 40% capacity. And then this uh, turbine is coming back from Canada where there was this maintenance work and it's still standing in Mülheim an der Ruhr, which is near to where I grew up in Germany. And apparently the Russians are not taking it and using it for their pipeline. And then out of the sudden there is the second turbine not working. I never heard of that a year before that we had out of the sudden, it's sudden turbine not working. And now there is a lag. Where does this lag come from? So every time that the market is coming down, you see it, the, fi the financial market on energy prices is really volatile. Every time we have a peak, then something is, uh, there are storage are sold, so it's coming down. But every time that there is something, and apparently if something is too smooth, too 
fast calming down, then out of the sudden, woohoo, there is another problem from the pipeline coming up, and that's what we see again this week. Exactly, and actually I think alternatives uh, that do not help here, because no. like with coal, exactly. even if we, okay, postpone this um, switching to green energy for some time, nevertheless, uh, due to droughts, for example, when you in Germany uh, wanted to transport that by ships, which by the way, I think infrastructure was not used by several years, so it's not only that there were droughts, uh, but, but also infrastructure issues. Yes. Uh, of course, there's a discussion on nuclear power. Uh, exactly. For example, in France, the, due to uh, service issues, to the technical difficulties, more than half of those nuclear power plants is not working right now. So it's a kind of paradox, but previously, uh, France was um, a country that was exporting the electricity. Right now, it is importing in such difficult and unpredictable times. Exactly. Well, what does this mean now for, for the economies and what does it mean for prices when we are looking at the energy prices? What does this mean for inflation for us consumers? Yeah, I think you perfectly know regarding inflation. Uh, that's all in media. You can see it actually in, in, stops, in shops, in stores. Uh, that inflation increased really a lot. Uh, it was in July 9.3% here in Austria, the highest level since 1975. Uh, and so really, really the high level. Uh, then in August, uh, somehow uh, it's, it uh, dropped to 9.1, but it's still very high. And when we take a look at the structure, fuel prices were not increasing as much as previously, uh, but other parts like uh, households energy or general energy um, was still fueling um, those inflation figures plus food, uh, and if we compare that, what the statistical office calls here is mini basket, that is like the basket of most typical um, goods that is um, uh, bought um, weekly, including fuel and food, that increase is 19% compared uh, to a previous year. Uh, so, so indeed, I think it affects not only households, but the overall economy, and we have quite a similar situation uh, in other countries, not only in Western European, but also in my home countries like Central and Eastern Europe. Well, mm -hmm. all of countries uh, have double-digit inflation, and actually we would like have to have 9.3 or 9.1 inflation, for example, in Poland. Yeah, but it is for us all that it is roughly the same level as in the 1970s when we had the first oil price shock. What we also see on the left-hand side is the PMI. It stands for Purchasing Manager Index. That's an index where you ask purchasing managers how is your output, how, is, how are your prices, and the neutral level is the 50, and everything above means rise. Everything below means decrease, and the far you are away from the 50 line, the stronger is this development. And this is actually something that I would have loved to see in my economic lectures, Economics 101, prices, demand, supply. It's, it's really, I mean, yes, we are talking about, about people, but nevertheless, from an economic point of view, it's great to see how prices are solving the market we have strong demand technically, we have a decrease in demand. This means prices go up and the demand goes low and then, price, uh, and then supply matches demand again. The only thing is that when I learned that in un the university, it was a thing of seconds. I just put in the new price and then it was solved. And re in reality, it needs months. So we see output prices are now slowly decreasing but uh, well, still increasing, but on a lower rate, but uh, output is coming down. And exactly that's what we see um, from theory into practice in this example. But uh, we talked about inflation rates, and inflation rates are quite strong, so of course, central banks are reacting to it. Actually, uh, today is Tuesday, so um, the day after tomorrow there will be the next ECB meeting and there will be an increase of interest rates. The question is only 0.5 percentage points or is it 0.75? That's the question here. Um, what is behind it? So 
central banks, it's clear for them that they cannot have a direct impact on the current inflation. No, that's clear. It's, it's driven by energy prices, by commodity prices, and they can, cannot do anything. The main obstacle that, or the main target that is looked at here is not the current inflation, but inflation expectations, because investments and big decisions are not made on the prices today, but on the prices in the future. And this is what they want to drive down by this increase in, um, in interest rates. So we see that the first one who moved was the United Kingdom um, with the Bank of England, and then the Fed um, catched up and actually got in the first place. Uh, Japan didn't move at all, but they have an inflation rate of 2.4% right now. I think that's still okay. <laughs> And the ECB, and here it is, the deposit rate went up by 0.5 percentage points. Yeah, come on, it was the Czech Central Bank that was made the first move. With exactly, okay, exactly, I know exactly. It's not I'm, the sorry. Same leap. I'm sorry, I wanted just to leap, say this, I is, to this say is kindergarten from, from compared my, to yours. From, from my region. Indeed, in Central and Eastern Europe, we have uh, a series of in increase of interest rates. Uh, like, for example, the Polish Central Bank already did 10 upgrades. Um, uh, interest rates are depending on the country in Central and Eastern Europe by 300, 400, or even close to 500, like in Hungary, basis points higher than they were at the beginning of this year. Uh, so I think we could also here refer to Austria. Uh, as, as you said, um, the ECB, that the level of interest rates is important. Uh, but also we see, and that comes, for example, from, from this business cycle survey that you call here conjuncture test, if my presentation is right. Can you it? Okay, thank you, Christian. I will <laughs> not use uh, German anymore. Um, uh, so, uh, well, like from the VIFO Institute, uh, it shows that uh, it's not only the level of interest rates that increased, but also the bank's reluctance or the restrictive mm -hmm. approach to provide financing. That is what comes from this survey, what companies actually experienced uh, recently. Uh, so I think when we have higher interest rates and uh, restrictive approach of, of banks, then uh, we, we will have weak financing, or rather, uh, as you said, with higher ex inflation expectations, we can see, we, we told you about those uh, sorry, GDP growth figures for Austria, which were relatively good. But when we put a split by components, it seems that already investments are going down. This is the negative contribution to GDP growth. It's going, it's affecting um, the economic activity that companies are right now reluctant to invest with such a huge uncertainty, with high inflation expectations, uh, with various reasons that we already discussed. Yeah, we will come to that in a second, but uh, the reason, one reason that I want to give you why the ECB is so reluctant in reaction, I think everybody is aware that it's different if you have one country and one central bank, or if you have one central bank and 19 countries, and one main obstacle is, of course, the spread in the, um, in the government bonds. You can see it here on the right-hand side. So I just explain it in German because it's a bit tricky if it's sure. okay. Also es geht hier um den Spread, das heißt die Zinsdifferenz zwischen der zehnjährigen Staatsanleihe des jeweiligen Landes im Vergleich zur deutschen Bundesanleihe. Aus welchen Gründen auch immer, als Deutsche sehe ich das gar nicht so gerne, dass wir Deutschen immer als Benchmark genommen werden, als die Streber von Europa, aber anscheinend ist es so. Und ähm, wir sehen hier die Zinsdifferenz jedes Mal zur deutschen Bundesanleihe. Das heißt, da ganz unten in dunkelblau, da schwebt Österreich. Das heißt, die Zinsdifferenz ist wirklich marginal, ziemlich vergleichbar mit der von Frankreich. Aber wenn wir uns da mal anschauen, was passiert in Spanien, was vor allem passiert in Griechenland und Italien. Italien und Griechenland haben ja einen ganz anderen äh, Verschuldungsgrad. Da muss man überlegen, dass ein kleiner Zinssprung für die EZB eine große Auswirkung hat, ähnlich wie bei Neil Armstrong, bei Griechenland und Italien. Und je stärker man das natürlich forciert, desto eher haben beide ein immens starkes Problem, das uns dann direkt wieder in die Staatsschuldenkrise führt. So I'm just talking about the risk that we are coming back to Euro debt, European debt crisis. And there is a new instrument that they're trying out, means they are actually buying again, where you think, what? Quantitative easing? They're buying again um, the uh, 
the papers of um, of central uh, sorry of government bonds for specific countries under specific circumstances while selling papers on the other side this means the balance sheet is unchanged but they could buy more Italian government bonds and then sell more Austrian government bonds because apparently Austria does not need any support here, but Greece and Italy does. And there are, of course, some rules for it, but none of these rules are actually actively working. Nice. It looks like, so, for example, a, a country cannot be in the current um, um, debt risk assessment, but this debt risk assessment is... Um, is cancelled right now, it's on pause until the end of 2023, so nice try. And there are other, um, other yeah, uh, things that, that these countries have to, um, to reach and everything is reachable. So this means we do not know what the ECB is doing behind our backs, they will not um, tell it, they will not publish on it. And that's a tricky situation that we are right now because of course, um, Austria, like Germany, we think that um, there should not be too much quantitative easing as we are right now already with so much money, with so high inflation going around. But we wanted to talk more about Austria and that's what we do on the next slide. Yeah, but just um, one sentence more on that what you said on ECB. I agree, I fully agree with you that it's a really difficult task. 19 countries where we have small Baltic countries, but still in the Eurozone, where inflation is above 20%. Oh yeah, sorry, forgot. Or, or for example, yeah. France, where inflation is, remind me, 6% or yeah, something, something like that like recently. We, we should go shopping in France. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, so, so, you know, it's difficult, or of course, uh, they should, they could do this approach, the bigger, than, the bigger country, then they should focus on that more, but I think at the same time it should not work this way because there are 19 countries in uh, different situations with different inflation levels. Exactly. Yes, so finally to Austria, uh, although we made already some, some inputs <laughs> on, on that, um, on the economy, on the Austrian economy. Well, so basically what we see is that what we already showed in terms of uh, survey data on PMI, for example, output Sick. prices and, and output itself. Uh, it's uh, copied here, I, I would say, in Austria, where the, indeed the mood deteriorated, but it's not only the mood, the, the expectation, the business climate, the foreign orders, that uh, those indicators uh, that either lost momentum or deteriorated. The, the slump is uh, quite significant. Uh, if we would like to add to that, for example, consumer confidence we talked uh, on uh, regarding inflation, it's the lowest level from the, the time series started, and it started in 1995, if Exactly, I 1995. So do you remember what number one hit was 1995? I'm a scat man, skip it, it, bum, ba, dum, bum. Do you remember that? You danced to that. Well, not everybody, some of us were too young, but you danced to that and it's ages ago. It's so long ago that it is in right now again. So think about that, how long this time is and the sentiment was never so negative right now compared to when this time series started in 1995. I should remember what we were dancing in 1975, you know, uh, in case of the inflation figure that was presently, but I was my memory not even is, is too bad. at that moment. My Come memory on. is too bad uh, regarding that. Uh, so, yeah, coming back not only consumer side, but also um, industrial side, uh, we, we put a chart here on the left hand side uh, regarding factors limiting production. The statistical offices uh, around Europe that are asking companies what's the factor that is limiting your production. Is it insufficient demand, labor shortages, or a lack of inputs, lack, lack of equipment? And we decided to put this, the latter one, so the lack of equipment, lack of inputs, as a factor limiting production. Not if companies perceive it, that's not a question. If that really limits production of industrial companies in Austria and in Germany like we have here. So, as you see, well, Germany is the most evident example. Nearly 100% of companies um, uh, recently declared that it's limiting their production, that it's um, actually the main obstacle for them. Yeah, but that was before the prices went up. So. Exactly. In Austria, maybe it looks like not so dangerous, but when you compare that to previous historic data, uh, this chart starts at uh, 2019, but if we even extend it by further data, you will see that uh, it was all-time high. 
Uh, indeed, that was, that was uh, a strong uh, problem. In recent months, it decreased. Uh, it seems that companies started to adopt what's happening, so to those lockdown, lockdowns in China, uh, to supply issues that we already had due to a war in Ukraine with the access to various commodities and so on. But I, I think it's just a part of the relief, because as you see, it remains still on a high level. It's still much higher than it used to be in the past, even not comparing before the pandemic or not, it's still much higher level. Exactly. And on the right-hand side, you see the business climate from the uh, Wirtschafts... Uh, WIFO. I yeah. don't know. What was yeah. it? Wirtschaftsforschungsinstitut. Um, so you see um, the business climate, foreign orders and production expectations, they went down. The good news is not as down as during the first big lockdown, but come on, nobody of us wants to come back to these levels. So uh, we are still right now on a very negative territory, which is comparable to around June 2020. And if you remember June 2020, that was not a, a time where things went well. But let's focus more on the sectors, because this is something that we also do. We do sector risk assessment for 13 sectors in a total of 28 different countries. Here you see the selection for Western Europe. And if you're wondering what does ICT means, it's information and communication technology. Exactly. And as you see, for Austria, we did a lot of downgrades, but it's not an exemption. <clears throat> we did it also for lots of Western European countries, other Western European countries. And also, uh, if we put here the regional average, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but also other regions are affected uh, by that. Uh, I think, uh, as I've noticed uh, from uh, my colleagues, we do not have really time to go into deep to that. Uh, so maybe let's go, Christiane, to our uh, slide, unless you would like to mention uh, something specific here. If you have any further questions, we can discuss this later on. But let's first look, have a look at the insolvency. Yeah, yeah, because that also affects this, those sector risk assessment and, yeah. and country risk assessments. I exactly. think it's, it's worth not... Uh, to, to spend some time on that. Well, so basically what's the picture in Austria here in case of business insolvencies? As you can see on the chart on the left-hand side, that dropped a lot, that dropped in 2020. So it's a kind of paradox. That was a pandemic, lockdowns, very difficult uh, ec economic situation, but that dropped significantly. Well, that's mostly to various support measures that were introduced, and it's not only the Austrian case. We have it also in lots of other countries, in a bulk of other countries where such measures were, were introduced. What's happening in latest data? We have an increase. Actually, we expected that, that once those support measures uh, will be fading out, and they are fading out, they are uh, terminated, then we will also see uh, business insolvencies going up. And as you can see, the latest data for Q1, Q2, 2022, uh, they are much higher than a year ago. In year-over-year -year comparison, we have an increase by 120%. So that's, that's really huge. It is. Uh, we, we can say it's coming back to the normality, that what we had previously. But here, in case of the sector split, if, because we provided here, we showed you here year-over-year -year dynamics. But if we separate that, for example, just the latest quarter, second quarter of 2022, and compare that to the second quarter of 2019, to check, indeed, is it the same level also in sectors that uh, business insolvencies came back? Uh, in some parts, not, but especially in those sectors like construction, financial services, trade, and the ICT, we see that already insolvencies are much higher than they used to be before the pandemic. And that one especially applies to the construction sector uh, here in Austria, when, when we see that uh, roughly one-fourth by 25%, the number of business insolvencies in Q2 2022 is higher than Q2 uh, 2019. Uh, so does does mean that the Austrian construction sector recovered from all the development through the pandemic, came to normal level in insolvencies, and now, due to the high prices, have a further increase? Yeah, exactly. Okay. There are lots of, lots of reasons here. Yeah? Higher prices of building materials, of, of various inputs that are using by the construction sector, labor shortages, higher interest rates, and that's what we said. So the reluctance to invest by companies, because yeah. remember, investments are not only in 
machines, new machines, but also buildings and so on. Uh, also on the new housing market, it's not as good as it was for, for last uh, year. So that is all already affecting. And I don't know what's your view, Christian, and how you have it in Germany, but I think right now, because previously I remember we made some analysis how fast it uh, gives uh, that the macroeconomic situation puts um, some impact on the microeconomic situation, so uh, with increase or decrease of insolvencies. Uh, and that was several months, half a year, nine years, depending on, on the country. Right now, I think that the process is faster. If we have so many companies not only suffering uh, from higher prices of commodities, but closing their activity, um, uh, like, for example, fertilizers, producers in Poland, in Lithuania, um, in, in other countries, um, aluminum factories uh, in Slovakia, zinc, factory, zinc factories in Netherlands, and then it's quite straight and forward uh, and faster way to, to insolvencies. Okay, so we sum up. Right now, we are still in good mood for Austria. I mean, 1.5% growth. And I would guess that Q3 could be still strong due to tourism, maybe? Yeah, tourism takes roughly 7% of GDP, and we see that overnight states are here higher than it used to be uh, a year ago. So it, could, it will support definitely. But winter is coming. Let's say it that way. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Do Could we have any questions? Ina, sorry. Uh, yes, we'll see. Um, I have maybe some questions here. I have one question, which is good because we're already a bit late. Um, we just compare gas storage on percentage levels. How is it when we compare total stored uh, megawatt per hours to the national need in a normal winter? Would uh, like to ask. Well, those, those levels, uh, as, far as, as I remember, at least in terms of the European average, um, uh, right now they are higher than roughly 12%, as far as I remember, to last year. Yeah. But compared to five years average, it's higher by 6%. So it's not, not huge, although we show this, those numbers that, okay, we are filling up. But it's not like it, it brought uh, really a significant uh, difference here. Um, but I think the question was more how long these gas storage will okay. hold on. So or? I yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is very different. So unfortunately, we do not have always the numbers here for every different country. I know that Austria, no, I don't. I know that Belgium, sorry, I'm also covering Belgium, I have to say that. Belgium has only um, storage for several weeks. In Germany, we have several months. I don't know how it is in Austria, to be honest. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think that all depends actually on that what we said. So how the winter will be, what, what will be the consumption. Exactly. Uh, so so it's, the consumption it's also we should not, we should not stick, stick to that. And also those discussions that we have on cap of the natural gas prices are good because the prices increased like a hell. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, it's also that uh, it, right now we have really a strong motivation, encouragement to limit consumption of gas. Uh, and uh, this is like um, self-mechanism that is using. I do not mean that the situation that we have right now with such high prices of gas is good, uh, but nevertheless, those cap measures should be done in a really reasonable uh, way. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I think we should continue now. So thank you so much. Um, vielen Dank. Applaus